I'm Blake, and I'm a data scientist at Foursquare. And uh, you know, New York City is not only a great place to be doing data science, <clears throat> but it's also a great topic of data science as well. And so that's why today I would like to focus on what we can learn about New York City by aggregating millions of check-ins created on Foursquare from native New Yorkers. You know, um, and then after I talk about that, I'd like to sort of mention some of the tools that we're building at Foursquare to help make cities like New York easier to use. So um, for the uninitiated, Foursquare is an app that helps you explore your city and connect with friends. And it's also a platform for creating and sharing location data. So you've probably seen this. As Drew mentioned, you know, when people get to a place, they pull out their phone and they check in in order to you know, share that location with friends or to discover new places, to get tips about the place that they're at. A lot of people use it to you know, keep track of the, uh, their visits, uh, keep a, sort of a personal diary of their life. What most people don't know is that Foursquare is generating a tremendous amount of data. So here's some of our uh, you know, global statistics. Uh, we've now had check-ins from over 20 million people. Uh, we're aware of over 40 million places worldwide. And we have over 2.5 billion historical check-ins in our database. Every second, roughly 80 people check in somewhere uh, all over the world. And it turns out a tremendous number of these check-ins are actually in New York City. Over 135 million of these check-ins are in New York. And so I'd like to talk today about sort of uh, what this data, um, what kind of questions we can ask of this data. And uh, I'd like to argue that this kind of data gives us sort of an unprecedented view into the behavior of you know, millions of people as they move around cities. So to help sort of you know, set the tone, I'd like to share this, this visualization of, of New York City. Let me, uh, let me walk you through this. So here we've taken over a year of check-in activity and plotted it on this map. Um, so every single um, pair of check-ins that we've observed that have happened within a few hours, we animate a dot moving between these two places in New York City. And so you can see as the time of day moves, you know, now we're now in, in the evening, you can see people moving around the city. So you know, it's, it's evening time. Uh, people are going to start going out to nightlife spots. You can see that the categories are color-coded. And then the city sleeps, albeit briefly. <laughs> and then, as you can see, in the morning, as the city wakes up, people stream in to the major transit centers, Penn Station and, and, uh, and Grand Central Station. And then people go to work. They get lunch. You know, we think that this, um, this very dynamic data can be used to understand all sorts of attributes about a city that we've never been able to measure before. I think this visualization is amazing. I think it looks almost more like, a, like an organism, like an anthill or something like that. So what are some of the you know, questions that we can ask of this data? So one of the most uh, sort of simple questions that you know, come to mind is, you know, what is a place? Uh, here I've taken two famous New York City places, and I've just plotted their check-ins on a map. Can anyone guess what the two places are? Central Park. Central Park. Yep, that's on the left. On the right? Airport. It's, it's an airport. Which one? JFK. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing that, you know, without actually showing you a map, you can pretty much recognize these two New York landmarks. For JFK, you can actually make out the terminals, the AirTran, the runways. All this data paints a very amazing picture about exactly where JFK is on the face of the Earth. Just from people going to JFK and pulling out their phone, saying that they're at JFK, sharing that with friends, we get this amazing map of exactly where JFK is. We didn't have a cartographer build this. Note that the color coding here is a, a probability distribution estimated to figure out where you are, um, depending on where you are, what the probability of being at that, that venue is. You know, it turns out that it's useful to also model these places, not only in space, but in time as well. So here are the you know, popularity patterns for three different kinds of places. Uh, in blue, we see a, a coffee shop, Gorilla Coffee. In red, uh, Gray's Papaya, another New York institution. <laughs> and in green, Amarino, a nice restaurant. So you can see that each one of these places is busy at a different time. 
Uh, Gorilla Coffee is you know, busy in the morning. Grace Papaya is busy in the afternoon. And Amarino is typically busy for dinner. That said, each single place has its own unique signature. Note that like Amarino serves brunch on Sundays. And uh, Grace Papaya, for example, has this strange peak late night on Friday and Saturday nights. <laughs> <laughs> This is the kind of data that we want to use to build our recommendation engine. Information about when different kinds of places are popular in the city. So for instance, these kinds of places are more popular on the weekends versus weekdays. You know, stadiums, flea markets, dim sum restaurants, and pool halls. We can also use this data to better understand what neighborhoods are. So here I've plotted the activity distribution for two famous New York neighborhoods, Soho and the East Village. Uh, the percentage shown is how much it deviates from the average New York neighborhood. So you can see that in Soho, people typically check in more to offices, clothing stores, and coffee shops, where in the East Village, people check in more to bars, pizza places, dive bars, pubs, sports bars, wine bars, <laughs> cocktail bars, lounges. You can see why Foursquare was started in the East Village. <laughs> But no, but seriously, I think that this is an amazing perspective of a neighborhood, right? How, uh, what are, what's the activity distribution of things that are being done in that neighborhood, and when are they being done? Uh, we can actually use this to figure out which neighborhoods in New York City are similar. So for instance, we've shown that um, by comparing those distributions using a, simil a simple cosine similarity metric, we can produce a matrix like this, which shows the similarities between all the New York neighborhoods. So for instance, we can see that the East Village and the Lower East Side are very similar, that Soho, Murray Hill, and the Flatiron District are very similar, and that Inwood and um, Williamsburg are very similar, despite being separated by great geographical distance. In terms of this latent activity space, these neighborhoods are actually quite similar in terms of what people are actually doing in those places. Some interesting researchers uh, out of CMU took this a step further recently. Uh, by actually trying to redraw neighborhood boundaries based on this social activity data. So before I was talking about neighborhoods that you guys obviously know about, these guys decided to sort of scrap those neighborhoods and create these things called livehoods. So clusters of places in New York City that have similar behavioral characteristics. I think it's pretty amazing to think about what this data would have looked like 20 years ago. If you wanted to draw neighborhood boundaries 20 years ago, you'd hire a cartographer or maybe a group of cartographers. Here, we've essentially hired a million people to map the city and figure out which areas of the city are similar and which are different. I think that would be very surprising to people who made maps 20 years ago. This data also lets us evaluate how the city behaves under different circumstances. For instance, how it behaves uh, when certain external factors are applied. One question you might ask is, you know, what happens in New York City when the temperature goes up? It turns out people get ice cream. <laughs> it's actually pretty amazing how strongly correlated ice cream consumption in New York is with the temperature. Here we see blue is the temperature, and green is ice cream, uh, the percentage of check-ins at ice cream shops over 2011. So not only is there a strong correlation, in fact, it's very strong. Uh, it turns out for every degree above 60, ice cream consumption in New York rises 2.1%. But it also turns out that strong shocks in temperature, so like unexpected peaks, similarly trigger unexpected peaks in ice cream consumption. There's actually lots of places in New York City that are um, popular based on the weather. So here's some you know, warm weather spots ice cream shops, roof decks, boats or ferries. And here's some cold weather spots, art galleries, uh, skating rinks. I think ramen and noodle houses are very interesting, interesting fun. I particularly like that when it's cold out. So we can also ask questions about how New York behaves when new places open. So for instance, or uh, you know, one question we could ask is, you know, what happens when a new coffee shop opens in the East Village? So this is La Colombe. Uh, it opened recently. Uh, at the time it opened, it was right next to the old Foursquare office. And you know, this was kind of a big deal. You know, Foursquare employees, they love two things. They love coffee 
and they love beer. And so because they have every single place in New York City meticulously mapped, uh, when this coffee shop opened, it was you know, quite, the, quite the news in the office. And so it got me wondering, you know, what does it look like when a coffee shop opens? Not necessarily in terms of um, uh, you know, how its popularity rises, but you know, how it affects the people in that area and the people around it. So again, five years, someone might create something like this when a coffee shop opens. This is just plotting you know, the number of check-ins, so the number of people who are coming to this coffee shop as time goes on. You can see the coffee shop's doing really well. It's at three days. It's already got 160 people who've discovered this place. You know, back in the day, someone might be sitting out there on the street with a clicker counting, you know, like, this is how many people are coming to my, coming to my venue. I think that there's a much sort of richer phenomenon that's going on underneath. So here's another picture of what's going on. Again, we see number of check-ins on the right. But now on the left, I'm also plotting the social graph of the people who are discovering this place. So every single dot here represents a friendship between two people. And so you can see, out of the first 120 people that have come to that place, there's this strong interconnected clique. They're much more likely to be friends with each other than friends with other people. And that's what I'm trying to quantify with this sort of virality measure in the middle, is how much is this place spreading through existing friendship connections? Or, is being, or how much are you targeting new areas of the social graph that you haven't seen before? I think this is an amazing perspective on uh, how, like what happens in terms of the people around this coffee shop. So here, let me show you another, um, another version of what's going on here. So here is a, a plot of the social graph of La Cologne. This is, every single node in this plot is a person. Every single edge is a friendship. Uh, everyone here will eventually check into La Cologne. As people check in, you can see that they light up in orange, and they expose their local area of the social graph to this, this place. Because you know, they check in, and, and friends see each other's check-ins. You can see here that as, um, and so time is moving forward. As time moves forward, uh, you're going to see that this coffee shop is essentially going to spread across this social graph. It's going to move from the left-hand side and the bottom. The bottom side is that um, dense, connected clique that just sort of discovers La Colombe first that we saw in the previous plot. You know, people talk a lot about uh, memes and how they spread on the internet. I think this is interesting because this is basically a physical place that's spreading virally through a, a network of people. This visualization was created by taking the social graph and using a graph embedding algorithm called stochastic structure preserving embedding. You know, it used to be that if you wanted to run a business and you wanted to expose more people to it, you would put out a chalkboard in front of your business and, and then you'd make sure that people were you know, spatially exposed to your, to your, uh, to your you know, new coffee shop. We're saying now that you know, because we have access to all this data about how people are connected and how they're connected to places, you know, perhaps now when you start a new coffee shop, you should think about how to make sure that people are socially exposed to your new place. I'm not sure if I'm going to wait. If you notice, the big dot in the middle that keeps lighting up is Dennis. <laughs> He's the founder of Foursquare. The size of the dots is proportional to the number of friends. I'm not sure if I'm going to wait until he uh, checks in. <laughs> Here's another question that we think a lot about at Foursquare, and which I get all the time, right? You know, what are the best places? You know, what's the best sushi place in New York? What's the best pizza place? Um, you know, there's a lot of services now that help you, you know, find the best places by, uh, you know, people leave reviews, people leave tips, people like places. We think that by using uh, this sort of aggregate check-in data, uh, we can create better tools to find the best places in a city. So, you know, here's some of the signals that we like to think about for doing this. Of course, popularity, you know, good places are often very popular. And, you know, rating, this is a sort of a, a very standard... Uh, you know, technique for figuring out which places are the best. And sentiment, you know, how people talk about a place. 
But I'd like to focus on sort of expertise and loyalty. I think these two ideas are very powerful for finding the best places in a city. Expert, by expertise, I mean, um, if you have all this data about where people go and how they influence other people, you can identify experts. You can figure out you know, who has been to the most sushi restaurants and who um, influences a lot of people to go to sushi restaurants. I think that taking the word of a sushi expert sounds better than taking the word of anyone who just chooses to you know, write a review or leave a comment. Similarly, there's an idea here that people vote with their feet, right? You know, it's a lot, it takes a lot of friction to, you know, go onto a website and write a review. But, you know, we have thousands of people visiting most of the restaurants in New York. And, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if you could just ask, hey, did people go back to those places? We think that this, is a, this idea of loyalty is very important also for uh, figuring out what the best places are in a city. And so this brings me to explore. This is our tool for exploring a city. We think that um, this is a sort of a powerful uh, tool for making cities easier to use. So Explore is a social recommendation engine, and it's built from all this aggregate check-in data. We want people to be able to pull out Explore anywhere in the world and get a great recommendation for whatever they're looking for, you know, burgers, drinks, pizza, whatever. And we want it to be curated by their social network and highly personalized to their tastes. So these are just some of the signals that go into our recommendation engine. The location, the time of day, your personal check-in history, the preferences of yourself and your friends, all of this interesting aggregate data that we can come up with, such as the similarities between venues, and all this aggregate historical data you know, about which places are popular and when. So, in conclusion, I want to stress that this is a very unique data set created by people interacting with each other and with places in the real world. And you know, today, we're talking about 20 million users, but there are now over a billion people in the world carrying around a device like this in their pocket, which is just constantly emitting this stream of location data, the stream of latitudes and longitudes that we can use to help improve our cities and make them easier to use. I think that this data acts almost like a, like a microscope for cities, allowing us to inspect and measure the behavior of these cities at a higher resolution than ever before. Thanks so much for your time.